receive specialty consultation from any um, of our telehealth clinics via any of your team providers. So in other words, it doesn't have to be the primary care person who asks for consultation. So if a dietitian, nurse practitioner, RN, MA, uh, social worker, care coordinator, if someone presents a patient to one of these clinics and asks for consultation on behalf of the team, the next time that the patient comes into clinic, um, the visit can be um, uh, coded with a Q code for an additional $150 reimbursement. And at this point, there's no limit on those. So if you have a fairly complicated patient that we're looking at, you know, every one or two months in clinic, um, at this point, Melina hasn't put a cap on reimbursement per patient. So this is really helpful. But the point here is it doesn't have to be the primary health care provider who does the, the, the case presentation. It can be any member of the team. The idea is that we want to get this information out so that the, the child has opportunities to touch the the specialist when they can't get in. So all those clinics are listed there. So if you have questions, let us know. All right, so we're going to talk about um, di type 2 diabetes in children. And the reason all of this was, was asked of us here at Envision was because of some articles that were published in January. Um, so this is a two-part um, discussion. Mine is today on uh, the nutrition management, so particularly the role of the nutrition professional and nutrition in management of type 2 diabetes. But the second part will be on June 28th, and I know it's a little bit far away, but that was the schedule of the presenters. Ellen Kaufman, who's a pediatric endocrinologist at Press, and she'll be doing the medical management piece that goes along with these articles that you got in your registration link. Um, so the reason why we are, are interested in this, not in addition, also because we were given all of these things in our inboxes, oh wow, there's new recommendations. Um, but it, for the reasons that one in three new cases of diabetes in the United States for children less than 18 years of age are now type 2 diabetes. When I started my practice more than 26 years ago, um, most of the children that I saw had type 1 diabetes. I mean, it was really, really rare. Uh, to see a child with type 2 diabetes, and I'm sure that's the experience of a lot of you. And there is disproportionate representation in ethnic minorities. And New Mexico is, is one of those states where we have a very diverse population. Unfortunately, many of them are at risk for type 2 diabetes. The other thing is, regardless of age, whether you're looking mm -hmm. at adults or, or children with type 2 diabetes, most of them are cared for by their PCPs. In other words, they're not going to an endocrinologist or necessarily an internal medicine <coughs> physician unless that person also happens to be their, their primary. So how do you take care of these kids in a primary health care community setting? There is a severe shortage of pediatric endocrinologists, not just in New Mexico, but nationwide. And as, as you read some of these reports, they've got some fairly alarming statistics. But um, many states, more than half, maybe have one or two people in the whole state that, that the population has access to in terms of, of um, expertise in, in managing diabetes. So therefore, the multidisciplinary team approach to care is ideal. The other thing that I have to say in one of the references in, in, a, in AAP news that came out um, in January, the uh, editor who, who wrote the little the piece at the beginning of that um, magazine type format for American Academy of Pediatrics said, telehealth is the way to deal with this because we don't have enough endocrinologists, we don't have enough specialists in this area, so how are we going to help our, our primary care providers? So. Um, we've been trying to do that now for a number of years, and so it's nice to have that um, noticed on a, on a national stage. So medical nutrition therapy is still the cornerstone of initial and ongoing care for diabetes, whether you're looking at type 1 diabetes or type 2, but certainly in type 2. Uh, and when you look at some of these uh, references, which I put here at the beginning rather than the end, so you kind of know where we're going from, there were two articles that were in uh, the Journal of, uh, of Pediatrics, which is the Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics in January of this year, 2013. One was on management of type 2 diabetes in children and adolescents, and the other was management of newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes mellitus in, in children and adolescents. Now, the difference between two of these two things is one has the very sp specific key recommendations, which we're going to talk about today, 
The other is a technical report. So there's some academic value to these particular journals in that they go through how you get to evidence-based medicine given a review of the literature. So they actually outline in the technical report how they reviewed articles, what criteria they used to um, establish the recommendations for these, for these key um, approaches, which we're going to talk about. The third one is that editorial that I talked about, um, which is the AAP guideline editorial in AAP News. The next three are from a publication by the Pediatric Nutrition Practice Group of the Academy for Nutrition and Dietetics. And they have four times a year uh, um, a mailing, either online or in paper. And it was interesting that this corresponded with the release of these other articles. So uh, the first one is by a pediatric endocrinologist, Dr. Brennan, who talks about diabetes care. And the last two are about um, how, as nutrition providers, we would approach um, nutrition care. And then the last is a case study about double diabetes, which we might want to talk about at the end. I'm sure Dr. Kaufman's probably going to bring that up, this, this sort of new diagnostic category that we, we aren't even starting to talk about today. Is double diabetes having both one and two? Both, ha both having one and two. Okay. And they, don't, they can occur in different order. That's why it's... You know, oh. we, I think it's an interesting discussion. You can present with one and end up with something else, but it changes the <coughs> management because you're dealing with two different kinds of pathophysiology, so you have to approach the care for each one of them in concert, so it makes it more complicated. The case that's actually in here, if we run out of wonderful things to talk about, I can, I can show you this as a child who was initially diagnosed with type 1 and in the end ended up with type 2 on top of that the pathophysiology so the management of that becomes even more complicated so yeah so I'll just if you don't mind no absolutely say a little bit about that um, in adults um, well in the entire population obesity is in an epidemic and obesity causes insulin resistance so even if you're a type 1 you're still part of the population and you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and so you can become more insulin resistant and thus develop type 2 on top of your type 1. And it's fairly under-recognized. Um, it's more, and it's not very well treated because it's more, well, they're not compliant or adherent, um, something's wrong, but it's just we need to be more aggressive. We now need to put them on oral medications, even though they're type 1, that help improve insulin sensitivity. So it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem. Do you have a pun you want to say, Dan? No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, just stay tuned for that because it's going to be um, much more common. So they might call it type 3. That was the other thing I found in the literature. So double diabetes or type 3. Type 1 plus type 2 equals three. equals 3. Um, and this, in this one article by uh, Dr. Brennan, he makes a note to himself in their EMR to put type 3 in parentheses to remind himself because there is no diagnostic language for that yet. So how do you keep track of the fact that your primary diagnosis is type 1 but you're actually treating essentially two diseases at the same time? Um, so I think that becomes an issue as we try to even find that in an electronic medical record. If there's no way to code for it, then how are we going to find it? Secondary diagnosis, I guess, but do they cancel each other? Uh, anyway. <clears throat> All right. So the key action statements that come out of both of these um, major articles from pediatrics, and again, we're going to take the nutrition providers, um, nutrition professionals uh, perspective today. So the first one is initiation of insulin therapy when adolescents present with ketosis, DKA, or when the diagnosis of type 1, type 2 is unclear. Um, and they specify specific, you know, in the sense that if your hemoglobin A1C is greater than 9 when you present, or if you have random venous or plasma blood glucose is greater than 250. So that is potentially relevant to one of our cases today. So the interesting thing is I remember the first case of a child, she was a Native American girl about age 14, who came into the PICU and DKA, and that was the first time we'd seen in our practice a child with type 2 diabetes present with DKA, because you don't expect that. Um, and then, you know, once the workup was done in the PIC, because obviously she was extremely sick, so there was no, people weren't thinking type 2 diabetes when, when she ended up in the ICU, but, you know, eventually when we got involved with her, because now we realize this is what we're treating, and then, you know, we're called in to, um, to get her ready for her outpatient um, follow-up with us. 
The second one is um, initiate lifestyle modifications, nutrition, physical activity, and start metformin as a first-line therapy at the time of diagnosis. So Kathleen Collins talked about this multiple times about starting, um, starting metformin. But it's interesting if we think about somebody who may need insulin at the same time that they need metformin, then we're in a completely different, um, a completely different place. So this is the first, you know, under this this one, or this number two key action statement. This is the first place where you'll see the nutrition provider becoming important because, in addition to metformin or insulin, whichever you're starting with or both, you have to start with how this all relates to the way people are eating and the way they're moving. Um, so this is where we start to get involved. And the issue, and, and Dr. Collins talked about this before. If you look at the studies of what metformin, metformin alone. Metformin with physical activity. It was the what was the study? The the DPP. Yeah, diabetes and then prevention and then program. there's the one that that was identifying just diabetes in youth, and I can't remember the right. Word, I can't uh, remember. the acronym. But basically, nutritional and physical activity, even by themselves in the short term, work pretty well. But they're not going to be enough in the long term. So even if someone's pretty successful. Um, there's going to be a change in uh, the progression of the diet of the disease and so by themselves uh, you're not going to be able to maintain whatever goals you set for yourself number three key action statement is monitor hemoglobin a1c's every three months and intensify treatment if not in the treatment range in other words your goals that you've set with the family or with the provider aren't met so the target in in pediatrics is less than seven percent and this is what was came came out in these articles for management of type 2 diabetes so those of you who have experience working with children with diabetes this is a pretty aggressive target uh, they're even suggesting around 6.5 if really what you're only looking at is type 2 diabetes. So modifications in medical nutrition therapy and exercise can have profound impacts on how this looks. Uh, in terms of once we get those hemoglobin A1Cs back, what are they going to do with them? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit um, on one of the other key statements, which is this one, number four. Home blood glucose monitoring for those taking insulin or those initiating or changing therapy. So this is the, one of those funny things that I think between adult um, providers who manage primarily adults with type 2 diabetes and, and providers who manage children who have both type 1 and type 2, we're all in the mode that we need to check a lot. Um, and that's my, I'm, this is, you know, full disclosure, this is my personal opinion. I think feedback is a useful coaching tool. So... For children who have been diagnosed, realizing that even in children you might be looking at a five to ten year lag on diagnosis, just like you are in adults, unless pediatricians are really good about screening every year, you might still be five years into a diabetes diagnosis before the diagnosis is ever made. So at that point, I think it's really useful to get kids and their families ready to look at their own data, which to me is blood, home blood glucose monitoring, and I like four times a day fasting and postprandial blood sugars because we're going to be asking these families and these children to make fairly significant changes in their exercise and their intake and it's helpful to know right away that if I change my breakfast that makes a difference if I change my bedtime snack that makes a difference if I change my metformin dose that makes a difference if I change and if you of course have insulin therapy on top of it you don't get a choice you get to check a lot um, I think we do families and children a disservice when we say you have diabetes is really terrible disease but ah you can just check whenever which unfortunately I've had some family um, personal experience with people in my family diagnosed with diabetes in that same kind of sort of <clears throat> nonchalant way like, no 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 if you're gonna get started on all this stuff we're gonna find out what all of it's doing so that was one of the recommendations that comes out in, in these reports is that the usefulness of home blood glucose monitoring probably needs to be play a larger role in the work that we do. So here's where your nutrition professionals really get a lot of credit here, is in key action statement number five. In fact, they've gone as far as to say that to incorporate the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Pediatric Weight Management Evidence-Based Nutrition Guidelines, which we're going to look at. So you know where those things are, because there's pages and pages of them. But it, again, it's, it, it's a nice resource, especially if you're trying to not um, create the evidence-based practice yourself, but try to get a handle on how that's actually going to fit in the practice environment you find yourself. 
Also here at Envision, we have a couple of approaches to this for general population uh, prevention, but also early um, therapy. One, key messaging, and our key messages are play hard, turn it off, drink water, and eat well. That works even when you have a new diagnosis of diabetes and you're trying to sort of frame this in an overall healthy lifestyle for the child and for the family. And then our zip to health guidelines um, that we use with providers around the state the 75210 message. The seven means seven breakfasts, so you're gonna eat breakfast every morning. The five means at least five fruits and vegetable servings every day. Two means two hours or less of recreational screen time, non-academic screen time. Now that doesn't mean that you can't use your Xbox or your Wii for exercise. It just means sitting and looking at YouTube videos or you know whatever. Um, two hours or less. The one is an hour of physical activity, so moderate to vigorous physical activity. And zero means no sugar sweetened beverages. So those are those messages. And we're going to take a look at some of these websites now so that you can kind of see what the resources are. So this is an algorithm. You can go back to, you know, we can page back um, through this site. Maybe. <laughs> doesn't want to let me do it. So this is the, the front page of this. So this pediatric weight management guide, and this comes from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, it's out there for public consumption. You don't need to log into this to get access to it. And, you know, as you go through this thing, you can see that there are multiple ways you can use the information. But what the page I was on before was is the actual algorithm <coughs> that you go through for management and screening. And you can kind of see where we, where we fit in here. So red shading is the link to a subflow chart. Blue shading indicates the link to a recommendation. Purple shading indicates a link to evidence uh, for which no recommendation was formulated. So in other words, linked back to that whole process of evaluating the strength of the literature in terms of the way that we manage overweight children. Um, the solid blue line is a path in the algorithm. The dashed blue line indicates there's something that you should probably consider, though it's not written into the algorithm. So if we start here, with this first referral uh, for medical nutrition therapy, and we're assuming in this setting that we're talking about a child with type 2 diabetes, we would screen for appropriateness of weight management and then also consider screening for eating disorders, pregnancy, or any other um, comorbid condition <coughs> or therapy that's going on that might impact what we're seeing. And then decide, is weight management something that we need to consider? Um, and it's interesting that they have it set up here because we would probably, those of us in the room, would use uh, BMI percentile and other measures of adiposity up here in our screening. We wouldn't wait to get down here. <laughs> We'd use that to decide whether we want to do this. Um, and then if you have a BMI that's greater than the 85th percentile, what does that mean? Does that mean that I need to go down here and look at risk factors? Does it mean that I'm, I'm not worried about it? Um, if the BMI is not there. And the point that I made this morning when I was talking to our dietitians group is it says brief weight management education. So this is the MI part of me and Kirsten Watch, you can correct me. If you've decided that there's no issue, why are you continuing to beat somebody's head? <laughs> with whatever it is. It doesn't mean you can't give them the key messages, you know, because that's just part of what you do every time you see a patient in your clinic. But if you've decided that the child has no risk factors and things are going pretty well, why wouldn't you just say, wow, it sounds like things are growing really well. Do you have any questions for me? <laughs> Instead of I'm still not comfortable with the fact that I decided that there are no questions here, no concerns. So anyway, that comes up a couple of places. Of course, they didn't ask my opinion before they put this algorithm together. So <laughs> it's uh, Kirsten's version of the world. Um, so once you've gotten to the point where you feel like there's a, a recommended path for weight management um, and treatment, then as you go through this, you have to decide how old the child is and what that changes in terms of are you aggressively looking for changes in BMI and weight loss or do you actually have a young child um, you know who's two to five years of age and what you're trying to do is make lifestyle modifications so that growth over time will help you um, and depending on what the diagnosis is if you have a child who's on insulin at that time or on some medication that that's going to require um, dietary management that's more aggressive that may change what you do. So I just wanted to let you know that all of that is out there. So you can actually go through all that, the nutrition diagnosis, the nutrition intervention, the monitoring evaluation, and it's all there um, for, for public consumption.
Determining energy needs in overweight children. So this is one of the issues. What do you do with a kid who's overweight? And this comes up when I work with the graduate students on main campus. Is do we use an adjusted ideal body weight? You know, do we, you know, how is it that we get at what, what we should be using for an estimate? And so this is basically using um, the PALS um, at, from the DRI. Uh, recommendations for actually figuring out uh, total energy expenditure and physical activity um, in the in the mix. Now, one of the things that you'll find if you read through the articles, um, the AAP articles, is that you um, should probably not consider um, dietary restriction below 900 calories, even in your pediatric population. So they're recommending 9 to 1200, depending on the age of the child. So the thing that we need to keep in mind is that when you get that low in terms of calories, we're really going to have a hard time meeting kids' needs for micronutrients. So we're going to have a really hard time meeting their calcium needs. We're going to have a really hard time meeting some of those other needs. And potentially even protein given the age of the child. So it makes it a little trickier than just, you know, let's let's put these, everybody on a 50-50 plate. That's certainly one way to approach it, but if you really need to, get, to change someone's BMI very, very quickly um, to help them get under control, um, then that kind of caloric restriction is going to mean you're going to have to be a lot more creative. And, and you might actually have to have them on supplements for a period of time. That was going to be my question. Do you put them on, on supplements? And if so, which ones? Yeah, and it depends on what nutrients you're concerned about. Do we, um, I never put kids on that low of a calorie <laughs> in general. Just getting them to make healthy choices is a big thing. But do we have um, medical type weight loss for pediatrics in New Mexico? Because that's below 900 would be that. We don't, do we? Not that mm -hmm. I'm aware of. Now, I should, I should say that now. I worked for years uh, managing children with epilepsy with yeah. the ketogenic diet. And there is some literature out there nationally about mm -hmm. using ketogenic diet for rapid weight loss. And Jane and I, you remember, what did we call our little thing? That we, the fast fast. The fast fast, <laughs> that's right. Where we actually, the goal was a 50-50 plate, mm -hmm. but over the course of several weeks, we started out for three days, they didn't have any carbohydrate intake at all. And then we added back each day mm -hmm. a serving of carbohydrate, either um, the fruit or the milk or the, the, the carbohydrate, so that they ultimately, over a period, I think it was three weeks, they, was it about Probably that? two to three weeks. Two to three weeks. They got back to um, a 50-50 plate. And what was really interesting about that, and, and primarily we were using this in young women who had a diagnosis of PCOS. So we know they had insulin resistance. They didn't at that point have any real alterations in their blood, blood sugars. But it made a really big difference for them. Yeah, and there were didn't. some young women who were truly committed to it who, who noticed significant, not necessarily that they went to uh, size six, no. but real improvement in, in their weight loss. And, so it was kind of a way to kickstart it, and our, our theory behind it, and there was some literature, it's not like we just stared at the ceiling tiles and came up with that, is that at that point they are so insulin resistant that what we're trying to do is force them to not have to need so much insulin secretion at mm -hmm. that point because you've dramatically dropped the amount of carbohydrate, and then you're slowly adding it back. So you've given them sort of an adjustment period um, to do that. So there's our next, you know research study. You can do the fast, fast in young women with PCOS and insulin resistance. Right, Kathleen? Yeah. Like that grant? You already <laughs> have the catchy publication phrase of yeah, fast, right. fast, fast. And probably fast. somewhere in my files, somewhere I have the outline because we wrote it all out. It was a handout and they got instructed cool. on this whole thing. But yes, it was very cool. Um, but there is some literature out there using the ketogenic diet, which when you use it the way it's intended for epilepsy, it is very restrictive in terms of calories. Mm -hmm. So for kids who end up, who are overweight, and that happens actually for some children who have epilepsy, they lose weight and they get down to being very slim. Um, there was one child that I remembered in our clinic who was, who was heavy. Um, she also had epilepsy and, and we decided that she would be treated best by using the ketogenic diet. Her family was very committed. She was on lots of meds, and so they wanted to get her off some of them. 
She did extremely well with her epilepsy management on the ketogenic diet. She slimmed down to a beautiful size, um, and she was not ambulatory, so it was helpful <clears throat> for the family not to have to move her. She it was easier to get her in and out of the wheelchair, and in fact, she could get herself out of the wheelchair and down to a crawl. Um, what was interesting is that we discovered after the ketogenic diet therapy and her weight loss that she actually had Prater Willie. Um, and we didn't know about that beforehand. It's just that when we restricted her calorie intake down, she started eating non-food items. Mm. Um, the coffee table, furniture, the rugs. I mean, because they were so good in the ketogenic diet of not having any food items around. So it created a number of other problems. She went to CGI because she ended up having a carpet ball in her stomach and you know it was you know it was but we didn't realize. However, it was really great from the standpoint of her body habitus and her epilepsy, she did beautifully, but the problem is is that we exacerbated another diagnosis that we didn't know was there at the same time. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But you will see people that use those very restrictive diets. Mm -hmm. um, there's a place in Florida, a group in Florida, that uh, inpatient where kids can go for yeah. ketogenic therapy. I just met an RD this week that did that. Um, and now she's a rep, but she did say that they, it's it's all very, you know, you calculate what you're going to give them. You have to supplement with vitamins to make up mm -hmm. what they're losing. And there are some studies about the ketogenic diet and the micronutrient deficiencies and how is best, but I can't speak to them. I know I've seen them. Yeah, so we had to supplement all our kids on yeah. keto therapy. There was no way we could meet their their nutrient micronutrient needs. They were all on supplements. Yeah. So, and then the last key action statement that comes out of these reports is encouraging sixty minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise daily. And we had a wonderful discussion two two sessions ago with Dr. Goins about how to actually do that <laughs> um, without having people get too uncomfortable um, with their children sweating and turning red and what have you. Um, so again, limiting non-academic screen time to less than two hours a day. And then the medication therapy may dictate how we are doing this in terms of how it's accomplished and monitored. So those kids who are actually on instant therapy, this makes it a little trickier. I mean, we have to have some different kind of protocols in place for them to monitor before and after exercise um, and may actually have to change insulin delivery on the days that they're involved in team sports or, or that kind of thing because they can become hypoglycemic and, and that's certainly not something that was pleasant to experience. So what are we supposed to do given those key statements and some of the stuff that I showed you uh, in terms of medical nutrition therapy uh, for diabetes? I showed you the American uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Evidence Library so you saw those slides and kind of where to access that and again you don't need a login to get to those. Um, focusing on family and patient-centered care which is we talk about that a lot here. Um, the idea that now, especially in adolescence, we have to really address the developmental patterns of children and adolescents. They think about things differently. They look at the world differently. Um, scaring them about their diabetes at age 50 is not going to work. They don't care. They're just worried about, you know, what they're going to do when they're not in school on Saturday. So really paying attention to the needs for physical growth. So if you go back to that algorithm and you look at the way... Um, overweight children are categorized. Are we talking about very young children, kids in early to middle adolescence? It depends on if we expect to have them have any more linear growth. It, it changes the way that we're going to approach this. And then really being um, paying attention to social and cognitive um, growth because at this point um, we have to approach things really differently. I was I did some direct service with a group of patients um, via telehealth yesterday, and it was a group of, of seven teenagers that are working on some of these things, and they're just funny, um, you know, out of the blue. And they, this group was had known it before I came in to do their session with them yesterday. They knew each other pretty well, so they were poking at each other, you know, about the management of their body style and and their exercise and their food choices and that kind of thing. Uh, and then, and Kevin was in the session with me, you know, you, sometimes you just have to let them just poke and then you come back and try to see if there was anything in what they said that you could then go on for the next step. <laughs> or, or did we completely lose our train of thought and have to go all the way back? And what is it we're all doing here together? <laughs> what did you want to get out of this? And then ensuring culturally appropriate approaches to care. So motivational interviewing really helps us here. Um, this morning we had a lot of providers in the IHS system, a lot of dietitians on the IHS system on our, on our call this morning. And there are all kinds of classes out there. We've all been to trainings that are supposed to make you culturally competent or sensitive or whatever. 
MI makes it really easy because you can just ask people and they will tell you their story. And if you say something and give them a space to say, no, we aren't going to do that, they'll let you know. <laughs> and then just by definition, you're, you're being appropriate with your approach to care and sensitive to that family's needs because you can't just say, well, everybody in the Navajo Nation approaches things this way. Everything, everybody in southern New Mexico who's of Mexican descent approaches things this way. Everybody who immigrated from Ireland in the last 20 years approaches it this way. There's no way we can memorize all those, um, all those intricacies, but if you just ask, people will tell you. All right, so we've already looked at these two things. So the other resources I wanted to show you um, are more about care <coughs> in general. And these, the interesting thing about this set of publications from the NIH is that they allow us to choose by age. Um, so you can actually, you know, I chose teens and children here, but you can actually choose a different <coughs> age. And you can also choose whether um, someone has prediabetes, if they're at risk, they don't know. Um, and you can also choose by race and ethnicity. So it also gives you, the materials are adapted for those different populations, and you can also choose many different languages, um, depending on who needs it. So I thought that was a, that was a good, um, that was a good approach. So these are all listed here um, for you to explore. And then, let's see. That's on the <clears throat> Academy of Nutrition and Diet. No, this is uh, um, NIH. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. And I'm trying to think. And then I like this one. This is in that same thing. But this is about transitions because this is what we've talked a little bit about this. But what happens when we've taken care of a, a child in a pediatric setting and Pediatric providers tend to be more in the mix with families and children over the time that they're managing. And that might not be the case when they move to an adult provider. So how do we prepare children and families to move to um, adult care of their chronic disease? So I thought that this was a really um, helpful thing, especially if we're actually um, working with a child who's been diagnosed sort of late in adolescence and they're going to make this, this jump pretty quickly. Um, to adult care. We were talking a little bit about our school health providers, whether they're on the school nursing side or whether they're in a school-based health center, being really helpful in this transition uh, and, and helping children learn about um, their care and, and really fostering that health literacy piece that we're after. So those are things for you guys to look at. And then the last really speaks to sort of our, our MI approach to things um, in working with this pet population. And this was from this last issue of the building block, which is the pediatric nutrition practice group. Um, a dietitian said, you know, we have some assumptions when we're working with children and adolescents with diabetes, so here they are. So we have to think about them. Our first assumption is our patients are as interested in diabetes education as we are. <laughs> Now, we all, you know, spend our days thinking about this and have gotten extra training and maybe made it our specialty. We're CDEs. Um, they aren't. <laughs> so approaching, knowing that up front that, you know, you're going to have to figure out how interested they are, um, you know, just push out, push the button and you start telling them everything you know about diabetes. Number two, we know what motivates our patients to change. Well, we don't know... Um, sort of theoretically, we have ways of finding out. And that's really what this is, is suggesting with this assumption, is that everybody's motivated by something. Most people are not motivated by the same thing. And so trying to figure out what that is to help them get where they want to go and realizing that motivation changes. Um, so what motivated you last week might be different than what motivates you this week. Third assumption, everyone can read. Just because people are fluent in particular language doesn't mean that they can read um, whatever it is that you've written down. So the suggestion here is, especially in this population, is to be really careful about giving reading materials um, as a way of doing education. Um, and I know, you know, Jane and I are looking at each other here across the table. We used to, when we did this with our, with our patients um, at UNM, we would put everything in a notebook, but we drew a lot of pictures. So we had a lot of blank pages where we did graphs with different colored ink about how insulin works and drew pictures of food and drew pictures of plates and practiced everything. So you didn't send somebody home until they practiced drawing up insulin, that they practiced giving saline shots, that they practiced checking their blood glucose, track, you know, practiced setting their, their meter with the new strips and all of these things. So 
not pointing out that people can't read, but making, um, knowing that not everyone <coughs> can, so all of your education should be sort of approached with the idea that there might be literacy issues in all of our patients. Um, and realizing that most of the directions for blood glucose meters are written for people with college education, or they're written in Chinese and they've been translated, and so now they don't make any sense in English or Spanish. So you have to show people how to do these things. Patients are willing to meet us more than halfway. Well, maybe, maybe not. Our patients will eat food we recommend, even if they don't like those foods. Everybody's laughing. How well does that work for you? I don't even eat foods I don't like. Why would somebody else do that? Children will respond as adults do, and so we've talked a little bit about that. The main thing is that children aren't going to respond to scare tactics. So if you have an adolescent and you're trying to tell them that their feet are going to get cut off when they're 35, that probably doesn't mean anything to them. They're like, ooh, cool, how gross. Yeah. No. <laughs> but they're not going to be worried that it's actually ever going to happen to them. Um, number seven, the patient's goals are equal to the RD's goals. Maybe, maybe not. However, if you ask, I'm sure they'll tell you. Effective education doesn't require knowledge of behavior principles. Well, we spent a lot of time talking about the fact that we do have to be sensitive to what behavior changes are required and principles of behavior change and principles of motivation. And number nine, patients' and caregivers' expectations are in line with those of the RD. Um, probably not. However, if we use motivational interviewing and ask, they will tell us what their expectations are. Um, and again, those expectations may change over time. So we have to set up a situation in which we're always seeking that input so that we're directing our, our therapy um, in the most effective way. So just leaving you all nutrition providers with some pat on the back. Few other professions play such an integral role in influencing and shaping the nutritional well-being of children in our communities. It's a great time to work in the field of pediatric nutrition. Embrace the challenge. <laughs> All right, did anybody sign on that we didn't acknowledge at this point? Hasn't announced themselves. I just signed on. Who are you? <laughs> Young, Parasita Young. Oh, hello. And you're with IHS in Arizona? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. So uh, let's open this up for questions around this topic. <clears throat> you can say that loud. Yes, you can. I can. I have a question. <laughs> sure. Oh, that's more interesting. How do you um, encourage or motivate parents? to change their eating habits to, because they, the child watches the parents eat or not eat vegetables. All right, Kirsten Watts. Want me to answer? We yeah. had to talk about this, I um, can't remember when it, when it was recently, about modeling those behaviors for your children and how powerful an impact that's going to have on them. So I found it, you know, it can be a challenging for sure. A lot of parents will think, my kid is the one that's sick, we'll put them on some special diet. We don't let them have soda, but I drink soda. So it, it is very big part of what I educate them about. And I'm always, you know, when I say I recommend this, I, I say I recommend your whole family does it, with the exception of the renal diet. <laughs> but, you know, DASH diet, kind of healthy eating patterns in general. And sometimes both parents aren't on the same page so that, that can become an issue. And the other parent that's not on the same page refuses to even come to the visits. So I just kind of reinforce in the parents that if you're the role model and that's what your kids always sing, that that's just going to send a positive message in itself. But I don't know if I have specific, you know, it's very individual. It depends on what I could get the family to do. <laughs> and I think it's probably helpful to acknowledge that it's hard for the parents too. Yeah. You know, the child, and we've had this discussion before, and even looking at kids with type 1 diabetes, the child is the one who entered the health system because they got sick, because something happened. But once the child's there, then the whole family is sort of up for grabs by the health care team, right? 
And that's not what they signed up for, right? They just brought their child because their child had heart disease or their child had diabetes or their child had renal disease. But then we get in there and we start asking and looking at, at the other things that are going on. So first of all, they're very uncomfortable with that. Mm -hmm. um, so acknowledging, I think, that that's uncomfortable that, and that this also is not necessarily a linear path to change, that we're going to try to do some things. And if there are some things that you can't give up, then maybe doing those in a place where your child can't see them. I recommend that a lot. <laughs> If you're going to have a soda, if you're going to have candy and you do that work when your kid's not seeing it, yeah, I mean, you can't expect yeah. them to see it and not do it. Mm -hmm. So I was going to ask, what if you start the conversation with the family or the parent? Tell me about your eating habits. But mm -hmm. so, um, because then you're really elevating the level of importance of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. But is that too intimidating? No, I do that all the time. <clears throat> I mean, if there's... If there's family members there, not just the child with me like an adolescent, I ask them, and then I go to the child and say, do you do that too? Okay. Or do you do that also? And then I ask mom about cooking. I ask the kid if they cook, what do you make? Because, you know, not always what mom makes is what the kid's eating. Mm -hmm. I do that um, as a way of keeping everyone involved in the room. But I don't ask directly just, you know, well, when your kid's not around, what else do you do type things? But yeah. I kind of, yeah. <laughs> so you don't want to know yeah. that. <laughs> what does the family do? How do you guys cook? How do you guys eat? Do you have meals together? Do you eat out together? So, And it usually goes off pretty well. Sometimes it doesn't. And I can usually tell when I walk in the room, when they, the expression on their face if they're happy to see me or not. <laughs> <laughs> Diet is a four-letter word. <laughs> it is. Uh, saying I'm going to send the dietitian in here to talk to you. <laughs> so it, it's a challenge, but it's an important challenge to overcome um, yeah. because you're not going to be successful, likely, if you just treat the child um, as this sort of entity um, unrelated to anything that the parent is doing. Yeah, and I have met, you know, like people in school with me that had grown up that way and um, developed eating disorders or different kind of things because of it. It really scared them maybe, and so they have like a fear of fat or whatever. So it can create a lot of problems you don't think about with the child. Maybe Dan knows more about that. <laughs> Just that sense of being like isolated, you know, from the family. No, not... no further thought about that one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Any other questions? Because we have two cases, so we can always go back to questions. That's true. Um, but if you still have questions, we're, we got a large group here, of, and our collective intelligence is impressive. Uh, so we want to make sure we take full advantage. I actually have another question. Um, in kids on Medicaid who have type 2 diabetes, does Medicaid pay for an abundance of test strips? Um, it's a great question. Because Medicare will pay for one test a day. I know. I went, I've gone through this yeah. with my own mother, and I... You had a fight. You know. I had a fight, but we fought it yeah. because it changed the management of the disease. When you can see that if you do this, it makes a difference... I mean, taking your hemoglobin A1C now down to 5.7 because you can monitor, why wouldn't you do that? I mean, okay, it costs you some extra test strips, but think of the other costs if you don't do right. that. Right. So I don't know. Okay. I don't know that we ever, we didn't run into that. So we, we still had to, even with the kids with type 1, we still had a fight because we were asking them to test a minimum of four times a right. day. And kids on insulin pumps, when I was managing those kids, you know, they could test anywhere from six to ten times a day, which goes way outside what most insurance providers are thinking about paying for. But I don't remember us being unsuccessful in making the argument. My experience of requesting authorization for testing supplies for our renal kids, not glucose, but albumin, or recommended over-the-counter items, which is how these are built, is that if you do the legwork and provide the medical justification, I don't know of any of our Medicaid programs that deny it, although they're not necessarily initially covered. Okay, thank you. But you probably, again, have that problem in the adult population. Yeah. 
it's just another obstacle that the healthcare system has to deal with, or the healthcare team, I guess. Yeah, and I think most insurers want to give you just three a day. But for a type one, that's virtually impossible to get any level of control um, by just testing three times a day. Okay, well, why don't we move on to... Lauren, do you want to do your case first? And, and the question is, do you want to come up here and run the show yourself? Or do you want to sit there? Um, it's up to you. If you talk, I can run it. Or you can come up here and run it yourself. Okay, sure. I'll come up there. <laughs> it's not really any different from there. <laughs> you can run it. <laughs> but she has control of the mouse up here. Yeah. Can you give her the mouse over there? Uh, will it work? Oh, well, then there you yeah. go. Let's pass it down. Let's try. <laughs> yeah, now we have to wireless everything. That's yeah. right. We have a wireless keyboard now and a wireless mouse. Kevin's upgrading us. He's keeping us in the 21st century. <laughs> a PC ritual. Pass the mouse. <laughs> uh, okay, so do I just sort of go through it? Mm -hmm. okay. So, as I said, I'm a dietetic intern, and um, during my clinical rotation, this was the very first pediatric patient I saw, and I was not with a dietitian at the time. So I did, I'll just come out and say, I think I did a very poor job of assessing them and knowing what to do with them. Um, but I went in to see him. He was seven years, a seven-year-old male, um, Hispanic, and he was in with a... So he came in for hypoxia and respiratory distress, I think as a result of some sort of upper respiratory infection and an asthma exacerbation. So he did have a diagnosis of asthma prior to this hospitalization. And that was really his only health, health medical history that was noted <coughs> in his chart. Um, so I went in to see him kind of thinking it was just going to be a, a routine, quick nutrition screen given that he was there for asthma. I know there's a lot of emerging research about a link between asthma and obesity, but um, I wasn't expecting an obese child. So I went in, uh, the patient was sleeping, so I didn't get to talk to him, um, but the mom and the grandmother were there. So I talked to both of them. Um, and it was just immediately apparent to me that this child was obese. Uh, so I, I tried to do a little fishing. I didn't, before going in there, I didn't have a height for him, so I didn't have any way to plot him on a growth chart, and I didn't really realize that 33 kilograms was so o overweight for a child of his age before going in there. <laughs> um, so I wasn't necessarily prepared to talk about that with the family. Uh, and so I did kind of, you know, food allergies, preferences, stuff like that, and from what I gathered from the mom, uh, I have some of the food preferences, kind of jumping ahead. So this is what the mom told me. She didn't have any concerns about his diet. She was a little unhappy with the food at the hospital because we didn't have his favorite foods, which were McDonald's and chicken tenders and pizza. Well, we had pizza. <laughs> so not a great diet from, from what I gathered. Um, and then we'll go back up. She... <clears throat> no food allergies. Um, I tried to kind of get at, did she think he was a, had a healthy weight by asking had his primary care doctor ever mentioned a concern about his growth or his weight? And she said, no, everything was good. Everything was fine. Um, so really no concerns there. So this patient was also on albuterol, and at the time he was on solumedrol for the asthma exacerbation, and that was short term in the hospital. Um, so when I was looking at his labs, the labs are at the bottom. Oh. Um, his fasting glucose was 126. And then his 24-hour CBGs, which are not necessarily fasting, ranged from 126 to 209. And he also had trace ketones in his urine. Um, the physician had ordered a hemoglobin A1C, um, but there was, that was still pending. 
and I, the physician was not there for me to talk to, so I didn't know if she had mentioned to the family that she was concerned about blood sugars, that diabetes might be an issue. Um, so I didn't know if it was within my scope of practice or if it was appropriate for me to bring this up as a concern at that time. And I also didn't know, could the solumedrol potentially be elevating his blood sugars to that range, in which case you really wouldn't want to scare the family about diabetes or or do you because this child is so obese that he's definitely at risk for diabetes he had some other risk factors as well his ethnicity um, a fa family history of second degree relatives with diabetes um, so we'll go back up to the top where my questions are So here's his anthropometric. So as I said, I was never able to get a height on him. Uh, the nurse didn't want to wake him up to measure him there. And then he was discharged before it ever was charted. Um, so I use a, the 50th percentile just as a refer an estimate. And if you use that, his BMI is greater than the 97th <coughs> percentile. Um, his, and his, even without a height, you know that his weight percentile is greater than the 95th. So. so these were my, th my three questions. First, given that on, upon assessment there was no hemoglobin A1C available yet and no diagnosis, would you as a dietitian mention to the family that diabetes is suspected in this child um, and if so, how would you go about doing that in the spirit of MI? Um, two, how elevated can you reasonably expect blood glucose to be in non-diabetic pediatric patients receiving uh, glucocorticosteroids? And also, so in this particular case, do you think this patient's CBGs could have been this high because of those medications? Or are we probably looking at prediabetes or diabetes? And then three, in a situation like this, how do you go about discussing obesity when the family really has no concerns and seems to think everything is fine or at least is pretending to think everything is fine? Especially when, I, it's one thing if they've been diagnosed with diabetes, it's an entryway, but when your diagnosis is there for something seemingly unrelated, how do you <coughs> broach that topic? Thank you. Um, this is Kathleen from Endocrinology. If you don't mind, can we start with question two? Yeah, and actually, go back to question one. That would one. be a better one to start with. That has a bit of a spirit of MI to it, actually. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Yeah. Um, the reason I want to start with question two is because it plays into question one. Yes. So, does this um, seven year old have diabetes? Is, is the big question. Certainly, if you look at his sugars, uh, fasting of 126 meets criteria for diabetes, and random sugars above 200 uh, meets criteria. Um, so you could uh, say, yes, by diagnostic criteria, he meets the, the definition of type 2 diabetes. Or based on the fasting glucose. And the randoms above 200. Sorry, I'm not seeing those. Those are down oh, below. It says oh, other, right. under other. Ah, right. uh, okay. Thank you. Additionally, this child has multiple risk factors for diabetes, including the fact that he's Hispanic, he is obese, he has a second degree relative with diabetes, that is his, uh, I can't remember, second degree relatives with diabetes, <laughs> and he um, has abdominal obesity. Uh, in, in children, um, you can use second-degree relatives as one of your risk factors. In adults, you use first-degree relatives. Uh, the reason you can use second-degree relatives in children is because the relatives might not have reached an age where that risk for diabetes, especially if they weren't obese as kids. So his mom could be 25, 26, 30. Uh, his grandma could be 45, 50, uh, and we know she's now at the age where she's at greater risk, but the mom might not be there yet, mm -hmm. even though she is at risk. So, um, so he's got multiple risk factors for diabetes. So that might further sway you to say this child has diabetes. 
However, the point that you raise is that the patient is one, sick with an asthma exacerbation, and two, he's being treated with um, glucocorticoids, cortisol, or steroids. Um, <clears throat> so we know that um, steroids increase blood sugar by increasing the liver's production of glucose and also by making the body more insulin resistant. Normal individuals who don't have any other problems can overcome this uh, with counterbalancing with insulin um, and their other hormones so that they don't manifest high blood sugars. Um, we see very similar pictures in people with medical stress. So often burn patients, um, ICU patients um, who are very stressed, all of their hormones are up and the hormones that especially counteract insulin, glucocorticoids, epinephrine, glucagon, uh, and growth hormone. But again, normally if the pancreas is functioning, they're able to overcome that. So I like to use it as assessment that this child is now at high risk for developing diabetes soon down the road because he should be able to overcome that, um, the glucocorticoid response by making enough insulin. He's probably going to go back to not having any high blood sugars once he gets off of the steroids, but the fact that he couldn't combat it while he was on the steroids means he's at very high risk. So you can actually use it as a teaching tool um, <clears throat> for um, them, you know, see this is where it's at. Um, we know that down the road, because he has all of these other risks, he's at very high risk, and he's only seven now. So we could be talking about next year, five years from now, or 10 years from now, but it's probably gonna happen. Um, so I don't think you can say he has diabetes at this point because he's got something else on top of it, but I think you can say he's at very high risk for diabetes, and we don't know for sure at this point until after he gets off of it and we retest him. Right. The A1C would actually be helpful in this setting because if it's a recent asthma exacerbation, it should be completely normal if it's all due to getting the medications. Mm -hmm. But if it's not normal, if it's above 5.7, then we know he's either got prediabetes um, or even diabetes. So, so that would actually be a helpful tool to help you answer the, the question, does he have diabetes? So I think with the information we have, we can't make that assumption. Um, and either get the A1C or wait till he's off of it and retest him. I think that's all I had to say. Appreciate the explanation and to some great questions. And what I'm hearing Dr. Colloran's explanation is rather than to say diabetes is suspected, is that the child is at risk for diabetes you know, from the standpoint of multiple factors. Is that correct, mm -hmm. Dr. Colloran? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so there's no real range you could you would say you'd expect to see blood sugars elevated when a patient's on this medication. Um, you no, would expect them to actually be fairly normal. Fairly normal, yeah. Okay. Unless if they can't overcome the, the yeah. Okay. So that's why I'm very concerned about his future of diabetes. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody have any questions or comments regarding that? I have a question. Okay. Um, so, like, at what point um, when someone's on chronic prednisone will you start seeing that they can no longer overcome that? Um, again, if they are otherwise have a healthy pancreas, mm -hmm. they can always overcome it. Okay. Um, but unfortunately, in today's world, a lot of people don't have healthy pancreases because of overweight and obesity. Okay. So, um, you know, we, there's a term steroid-induced diabetes yeah. um, that we use. Um, so that is sort of blaming it on the steroid, but there is something underneath that's sort of okay. uncovering it or unmasking it. So if they get off of the steroids, and often it's difficult when we use them chronically, um, mm -hmm then they may go back to normal, but again, they're still at this increased risk compared to somebody who did not develop steroid-induced diabetes or stress-induced hyperglycemia, I guess is what we call it. Okay. So there's not a point. Um, I guess the thing is, you know, if you know somebody's gonna be on long-term um, steroids, you know, years or months even, monitor the sugars, treat the hyperglycemia, um, 
while they're on the steroids and then readdress it once they're off of it. It's sort of, I think of it like gestational diabetes. Um, you're at, you're stressed when you're pregnant. <laughs> really stressed. Even if you feel great, you're still stressed. And you can get gestational diabetes as a result of that. And then the stress goes away when the baby comes out. Well, it actually just begins. <laughs> it depends on how you define stress. It's a different kind of stress. Different kind of stress. It's not an endogenous stress at that point. Um, and then you can go back to normal. But we know that every year after that, the, the mother who had gestational diabetes is at risk for developing type 2 diabetes down the road. So if you turn that around and there's situations where you have to use steroids in people who are at risk for diabetes, are you making their diabetes come out sooner or you more likely? That, see, that's turn? right. I think you're unmasking insulin resistance. But you're not pushing them towards a earlier diagnosis because you have to use the steroids. Um, you know, that's a great question. So... Um, so diabetes is due to insulin resistance in the body cells and then an inability to make enough insulin in the pancreas. So by giving them steroids, you're forcing the pancreas to overwork. And so then it's probably going to burn out sooner. Um, we know that we don't really see type 2 diabetes until half of the pancreas um, islet cells are lost. And so you may be pushing them closer to that sooner by forcing the pancreas to work harder. Pardon me, Dr. Cowher, did you say we don't see type 2 diabetes until half of the islet cells are destroyed? Mm -hmm. Type 2. Type 2. So it's a combination of both insulin resistance and loss of insulin secretion. In type 2. In type 2. Okay. But burnout as opposed to autoantibody Right. Right, it's burnout. It burnout. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got so it. in their attempt to overproduce insulin, they actually burn out and they get scarred down, and then, and then you start losing secretion. So in fitting with what Dr. Goins was asking, it's theoretically possible that the use of a corticosteroid could cause the pancreas to burn out sooner if used for any duration. It could have a burnout effect, right? kind of like a bad week on call. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's possible. I don't actually know the data. Yeah, um, but theoretically speaking. But theoretically. Is it also possible that if you change the insulin sensitivity side that you can alleviate that process? So our kids who are on prednisone for four months because of their nephrotic syndrome and who are overweight, we need to think about addressing that part. Right, so that's a great point. So even more physical activity uh, education um, because they are then at higher risk. So if we can make the rest of their body more insulin sensitive, um, then we'll overcome the defect that way. And that's probably the or better way to do it. Or at least mitigate it. Maybe right. you need to resurrect that old fast fast. <laughs> uh, the problem, it's somewhere. I know it's somewhere in somebody's file. It might even be in mine. <laughs> the problem in, the, in these kids is that they're sick. Otherwise, they wouldn't be on the, these medications. So you got to counterbalance that. And I also don't know if there's any data if you treat them concomitantly with an insulin sensitizer, like metformin, can you avoid um, the, the increased risk and in pushing them that way? I don't, I don't know that data, but I'll look into it. Well, and this kid's seven. I mean, I think that's the thing that's most alarming about this case, yes. is this child is seven years old. You know, and he already looks like this. So what if he his, his asthma is not managed? Because one of the other clinics we do here is, is around asthma is not managed well in the primary care environment. So he ends up with these multiple exacerbations over time, or they start using more rescue meds instead of his daily, you know, his daily meds. <clears throat> and so that you make that burnout happen quicker. And it's not because, it's just because we're not managing the other disease. Right. Right, and also on top of that, if he is having exacerbations, he's not being physically active because he's spending his time breathing. Right. So that's <laughs> going to further contribute to the problem. And um, 
And often when these kids do have multiple exacerbations, they go on chronic inhaled steroids mm -hmm. and occasionally high doses. And we always think that, oh, they don't get absorbed, but they can get absorbed. And I've, I've seen patients with Frank Cushing's syndrome just from their asthma medication. Mm -hmm. so, um, so at high doses, they can get absorbed. So we kind of don't want to have to go down that road. It certainly would be better than chronic um, oral steroids. But, yeah, but it's definitely a risk. But isn't that if they're using the combination ones? Because they really shouldn't be increasing the steroid dose for preventive, right? Or these these combination that have both the beta agnus and the steroid, and they're using it several times a day? Um, well, they use, it's the things like, I don't know the, the generic Simbicort. name, but Advair, yeah. Yeah. Simbicort. Simbicort. Yeah. So you can increase the dose of both. Um, so you can, and it's usually twice a day. Uh, so there's a low dose steroid, a medium dose steroid, and a high dose steroid. And if they've got severe asthma, they use um, that twice a day, and then they add a beta agonist for rescue in between. Um, but even with that steroid inhaler, you can get very high doses. So they're not supposed to add steroids for rescue, right. but um, they can still absorb the standard doses and um, cause problems. Did that answer that? Okay. Um, and then certainly his asthma will improve if his obesity improves. So this is one of those very right. circular <laughs> things that's going in every single direction. And that's the literature is not very uh, conclusive when looking at obesity and asthma exacerbation, but the idea is that you're looking at a similar mechanism, which is an inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. So if you can reduce the inflammation that you see in obesity, that potentially would have the same effect on the inflammatory process you see in asthma, and that the management of the asthma becomes better because you're treating them essentially the same, the same way. What works for one is going to work for both. So that might be a good in with the family mm -hmm. in terms of trying to motivate them to improve his asthma mm -hmm. by yes. secondarily mm -hmm. yes. improving his weight. Mm -hmm. And I think that and that avoiding. is future of diabetes. <laughs> so remember, we can't scare him. Oh, yeah. He said. That is the uh, a, approach that can be taken for the third question. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are many different right. approaches that can be taken, but it can fit into this comprehensive conversation. Mm -hmm. Could be even diagrammed, if you will, about what are the consequences of obesity, diabetes mellitus, asthmatic exacerbations. Mm -hmm. Why? Because obesity causes increased inflammation in the body. There are other consequences of that as well, such as eventual cardiovascular disease, mm -hmm. secondary perhaps to the diabetes. So there are a lot of risks that develop with obesity. Sure. And then it can lead to a discussion of obesity itself being a disease. Mm -hmm. And we would think of it more that way if we could identify a single cause, such as if there was severe hypothyroidism going on in this individual, such as they became obese, it would be easier to see the pathophysiology of that. Mm -hmm. but, it, but in this case, there isn't. There are multiple factors that are developing this disease of obesity. And that can be a way of addressing it with the family. Um, lastly, um, viewing their abilities or lack thereof in taking in the information can be thought about in terms of their psychological defenses because this is hard to hear. Mm -hmm. It's not, rather than a conscious pretending that it's not there, mm -hmm. it may be less conscious that mm -hmm. they're having difficulty taking in that information. Right. In a way where they're really trying to protect their family, their child, themselves. Yeah, definitely. But I wonder if, um, in some ways, if you put it straight with the asthma, that's, um, that would be more effective because it's hard to watch your child be hungry, we hear that, but he's hungry. But it's also hard to watch your child not be able to breathe. And right. so if you if you target just the asthma, even though that might be sneaky, I actually think that that might be more powerful than telling him not to feed him. You know, if we just think of we're nurturing with we're feeding, but that not breathing well really is hard to look at sure. in your child. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I 
almost can't do this completely, but leaving the obesity out of it, like you're really doing this for the breathing. For the breathing. Right. Is that no, I, motivation? That's, and that's doing to use? That, you know, instead absolutely. of talking about... that's what they're concerned about. Right. right. She's, not, she's already told me she's not concerned about the way he eats, not concerned about his weight. His pediatrician says he grows well, but she's obviously concerned about his asthma. Yes. They're in the hospital. So she's going to be tapping her fingers, waiting for you to finish that talk and get to his asthma. But and do it in the context sure. of asthma. But and back to the, uh, the um, exercise, because I re this is where I really tell them to start really small. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I tell them that once you get fit and you get over that hump, then the asthma will get better because they'll go out and try to be really compliant and do a lot and then. Uh -huh. They can't because of the breathing. So I think taking the steps up. And I think what really fits with Dr. Goins' explanation is, am I addressing a piece of the whole problem? And that it can be way too much to hear, like all of what I was going over, but mm -hmm. for them to hear about what they can relate to most in that moment can be most effective in the spirit of am I? Mm -hmm. And I think the last thing I think that's really important here too, all of that, is that this child's in the hospital. And is that a good place for us to learn about Amy? Mm -hmm. It's not. I mean, well, the, the asthma's in their face. The asthma's in their face, but just the hospital environment is a really bad place for education and intervention that's expected to be long term. I mean, sure. even when you have a child who comes in with a new diagnosis of diabetes, we are madly trying to get all, because you want them to go home. So they have to have some skill set, but the idea is these are the things you have to know in the next 48 hours so you can go home. We're going to see you in 48 hours. You have an appointment in the clinic, you're going to come back. And in the meantime, you can call us on this number if you're freaked out and your hair standing on end or you need to know what insulin dose to give. But the idea at that point is acknowledging that's a really bad place for chronic management kinds of approaches. Um, but I, I like the asthma thing and, and then that, that asthma approach because I think that's what the family's concerned about. And he's little and I think that's what they'll buy into. And it's not a lie. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of switching it around a bit. Healthy. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I know we have a case. I have a question about that because I have several kids just like this. And I cannot get parents to exercise them because they say they cough until they puke. I don't want to see my kid doing that. They cannot exercise the pulmonologist told me, don't want your kid exercise. You know, there's always an excuse for, because they're really concerned that their kid's going to stop breathing in front of them. So what kind of, I do say, you know, just take your kid on a five minute walk after dinner, just do something simple. And they still don't I have a few families that just do not exercise. And that they're coming more and more, more inhalers, more medicine, more weight gain. So what, like what specific things have you found that I don't know. I oh. used the joke about when I try to run to the bus, it almost kills me because yeah. <laughs> I'm out of shape. <coughs> Talking about how as you get fit, exercise costs less. Yeah. So, I don't so know. kind of letting them know that I it's going to be. I think most pulmonologists tell them not to exercise. They might be hearing the wrong thing. They yeah. might not want them exercising in a place where the allergens are. Right. Because yeah. that's what I've heard. You know, maybe you can't be out on the soccer field if right. you're allergic. Yeah. But. So what about resistance exercise, though, at this point? Yeah, I'm wondering yeah. if, like, an inside, so inside kind of you use the resistance bands or you use the therapy ball or you do. Yeah. So that it's not, it's less aerobic and more. More resistance exercises? Good and idea. the Wii. Yeah, I, yeah we, I think we really <laughs> kind of. I think you just tell the mom Xbox. to get them all clean in the house. <laughs> Yeah. They'll buy yeah, right, right into that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, your child can't exercise, but your pulmonologist did not say they couldn't mm. clean their room. Yeah. <laughs> Every day. Every day. Yeah. And when they get done Parents. with that one, they can start on mine. Yeah. <laughs> Bring mine. <them on. laughs> All right, Kathleen, are you ready for your... Oh, um, did you want to address number one? So what was number one again? You got you've got you're the keeper of the mouse down there. Um, did we oh, go, no. we've it's of actually did we answer? I think so. Your scope of practice question. Yeah, the scope of practice. Okay. Yeah. I uh, I address this all the time because our nephrotic syndrome kids, and even if you look at the handout that we give them, that's approved by the academy, it addresses that issue of 
it may not be a problem now but it's a risk factor and so don't you know let your kid eat all this sugar make sure they have healthy fats make sure they exercise mm -hmm. so and i address it you know i'm like you know this medicine puts them at risk for high blood sugar and high blood sugar can cause problems so let's talk about that really simple i don't ever say diabetes or anything like okay. that because they're already overwhelmed their kid has lupus or who knows what right so i i do address that all the time it's just way worded <laughs> okay yeah, so more about the risk. Yeah, basically mm -hmm. this medicine, you know, has anyone talked to you about it? Mm -hmm. Do you understand? Are you concerned about it? Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, I will present case number two. Okay, so you guys, since you have the mouse down there, Lauren, um, number two, you could run pass the, the mouse. Yeah, because I can't multi. I can multitask with every anything else. You can just run it from there. I could do. Oh, okay. oh yeah. Is it all the way? It's uh, go down <laughs> to where the uh, Word documents are. Oh, Word. Yeah, Bye, right there, that was my and it's going to be that first one. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Okay, so I'm presenting this on behalf of Lee Dubois, who couldn't be here, uh, but wanted some advice. And this is not a complete um, um, consult form, so, um, <clears throat> but I didn't fill it out, he did. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> so this is a 10-year-old um, Hispanic male. Um, who has, um, excuse me, um, a BMI percentile of 99.97%, a waist circumference of 36 inches. There's some question about the weight because um, down below it said his weight peaked at 191, but was now down to 187. But here it says 180. I guess that's why there's an asterisk. Um, the blood pressure was 119 over 78, and he did not do the um, determination of if that's less than the 90th, 90th percentile or more. And I'm sorry, I don't have those charts in front of me to I'll figure go, that I'll out. Go grab um, but that looks a little high for a 10 year old. Very high for <laughs> Okay, thank you. And he's, well, he's 5'1. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Um, okay. There is a family history of type 1 in his father and type 2 in his mother. Um, so that does not add up to type 3. Because <laughs> they're two different people. Um, there was no gestational diabetes. Um, however, I don't know if she had type 2 when she was pregnant. Um, but that's not, anyway, that's not clear. He was bottle fed. He did have, he does or did have childhood asthma, but it is improving. Um, he has an albuterol inhaler, but has not used that in 10 months. He loves, his social history loves all kinds of foods, very adult tastes. I don't really know what that means. Is it caviar and um, champagne <laughs> or is it McDonald's? Uh, he's often hungry and will sometimes steal food. Um, again, no further information about that, so that limits our discussion. However, he's a very bright and articulate child and has a cat. Um, let's see. He sleeps uh, seven to eight hours during the week and ten hours on weekends. Um, if he sleeps in the living room because there's extended family in this house, including... Um, maternal and paternal grandmothers. Um, and I, I'm not sure if he shares a bed in the living room with someone. Um, he, there's no reported snoring. Regarding nutrition and physical activities, uh, he drinks juice, that's 100%, 10 ounces four times a week. Does have four to five fruits and veggies. Gets breakfast at school, so that's a mixed bag. Um, Drinks milk 2% every other day. Um, very little fast food once every six weeks. There is a TV in the bedroom or probably in the living room in this case. Um, and the uh, parents reported that he is a multitasker and the TV is on in the background, but it's not the center of attention is what I'm assuming they're trying to articulate, but we'll talk about that. Um, Regarding types of exercise, he's, it says energetic, question mark. 
Energetic of motion inside hates something. Hate exercise. exercise. Hates exercise. No. Okay. <laughs> and does PE in school twice a week. Um, he does have mild acanthosis in his neck. He does not have acne. Um, the only labs that we have are an A1C that was done last May. It was 5.4. On readiness to change scale, his readiness to change is reported as a six. His confidence in making that change is a five. He does perceive that his weight is a problem. Readiness to change on the parental side, his father is at a 10 and his mother is at a two. Uh, and the father perceives the weight as the problem and the mother doesn't. So the question for this case is, what, uh, oh, what are the best first and next steps? And I believe the question was posed regarding this um, uh, difference in the parent's um, level of concern and readiness to change. And I did look up your blood pressure. Your cutoff for the 90th percentile is 120 over 78. Yeah, he's uh, pre-hypertension. And, okay. he's, and he's tall, so he's, he's at the 90th percentile for an 11-year-old. Mm. Okay. So, so that goes with, okay. So it's something to think about. Yeah. Okay. So, um, to summarize his risk, um, he's one has um, obesity, he has acanthosis, a sign of insulin resistance, and he has a, a he's Hispanic, and he has maternal, he has a first degree relative with type 2 diabetes. And I think when I did his BMI, I was about 34. Okay. And we have the charts if you want to look up. They're under the PDF um, thing if you want to look at them. But, but a 34, you know, in anybody. Surprise is only 34, I guess. But mm -hmm. there was also but, a question about his weight. Uh, right. Mm -hmm. But a 34, even in an adult, is obese. Is yeah. obese. So and in a young person, almost level in a young two person way. it's like off the chart. Yeah. It was off the chart. Yeah. I was debating yeah. where I should put the X. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? It just is an arrow. Yeah. <laughs> Into infinity on our EMR. <laughs> <laughs> so, who would like to help answer the next steps for this family? Am I, people? I'm going to go get Carol. I saw she's back. Oh. Yeah. Well, is this really, this is just a little tiny thing, but minimal juice, 100%, 10 ounces, four days a week. That's not that minimal. No. That's not that minimal. minimal you could start the first simple thing, eat your fruit instead of drinking it. But this is an interesting situation where there's a huge discrepancy between what the parents perceive, what parents perceive the issue. So I guess what I would do is start there. I don't know, mm -hmm. Dan, what do you think? Sounds good to me. <laughs> You're the psychiatrist. <laughs> No, it really sounds fine. I mean, if I referred this child to you, being that, you know, that, that I didn't know where to start, you know, the family had some concerns, but on the side they said, well, I think it's a problem, my wife doesn't think it's a problem, what should we do? And I'm like, well, okay, this sounds like a, sounds like a good behavioral health referral, and you ended up with them. How would oh, you start in, out with in that? The real, from, in, from the real world standpoint, I wouldn't happen that it way. would end up being uh, an assessment with a different kind of discussion than we usually do here. Right. Um, so I say it sounds good to me from the spirit of MI and meeting them where they are um, by identifying where there are some difficulties for this child, I think is a good place to be, and especially considering what the parent is ready to hear. And it could involve that approach of asking for permission to explore some of those things. So I'm just wondering if the, this is the primary care provider, if the primary care provider is just seeing this child on a follow-up visit. So this is just a routine well-child check when all these things were you know, sure. put down. In other words, the child didn't have any active thing going on at, the, at this point, right? Right. I don't think so. So, you know, given the fact this is the situation, um, and obviously the pediatrician or family practice doc has some concerns, um, given, you know, what's, you know, what's here. I mean, after having been presented with the growth chart, which I think is something that all providers should do, is just, this is, 
because it's part of the well child check. If that's the way it is, they know we're going to go over your immunizations. We're going to go over how things are going in school. We're going to go over your growth. I mean, you know, tell me what your child likes to do in free time. I mean, that's just part of the normal well child check. So what of the things that we've discussed today do you want to spend the last, you know, the rest of our visit on <laughs> or talk about? I, I don't know. Yeah, and sometimes when you get that, no, I want to go home. <laughs> Once in a while, if I have a real concern... Um, you don't want to walk away? I don't. I give them that, you know, the generic my plate or whatever with what a serving size is, which might be a good way to kind of bring them around to realizing that 10 ounces four times a day is a huge amount. So I'll, I'll say, you know, this is general kind of recommended for a child. Do you have any concerns that your kid's getting too little or too much of anything? And sometimes that will start that, and they'll be like, oh, okay, so, you know, maybe... Maybe they drink too much juice, or they do good on the veggies. Once in a while, if it's like a really big concern, and I know I'm not going to see them for a year, I might do that. I think it's a good idea to ask. Um, you know, sometimes. So you know, um, at the obesity clinic um, with Dr. Negretti and Ann O'Neill, if if they can't get anything out of them, they'll say, "Well, okay, would it be okay?" for me to give you any tips on continuing with your progress or anything like that. And they kind of bring up their concerns that way. And it's usually pretty well received. And I think another place to enter into this discussion has to do with exercise and the responses to the question about exercise. Because there seems to be some kind of rational mm -hmm. rationalization about how well he is yeah. energetic inside, even though he's not really in motion. <laughs> but we <laughs> really need to clarify something, whatever. I'm not sure what this means, but it seems to be in that realm uh -huh. that needs some clarification. Right. There's a lot of discrepancies. So um, the juice is a discrepancy. The parents report it as minimal. Mm -hmm. We don't agree that's minimal. There is the the physical activity. There is the TVs on in the background, but it's not an issue because mm -hmm. um, he's a yes. multitasker. So there's a lot of um, uh, what did you say? Justification or yeah, rationalization. rationalization that's going on. So uh, I don't know which parent filled out the form, or I mean, you know, was asked the questions. But um, I guess I would assume it was the mother since she's less ready, but maybe not. I mean, I don't think you can make an assumption. So kind of talking about those things. Um. I wonder with the energetic, because when we have kids with real heart disease, like a single ventricle, who I know they're, they have a ceiling of their activity, the parents will say, but he's hyper. But that's, that's like attention deficit hyper. Yeah. <laughs> that's very different from the exercise we're talking about, you know, this constant motion, but not getting your heart rate up type thing. So we talk about that a little bit about, you know, is that really exercise or is that just right. hyper? Yeah, restlessness. <laughs> wonder if that's, yeah. yeah, and just busyness, which can really wear parents out when they're seeing a kid do that, but I don't think it provides much exercise for them. Uh, there's one other thing I was wondering about. The comment is under... I guess it's sleep assessment. Only surviving child? Yeah, that's, yeah. I know, wondered if that... Yes, do we know yeah. what the... What this, I mean, we, we obviously don't hear, but you wonder what the context was and whether that impacts mom's yeah. mm -hmm. approach to... Mm -hmm. the oh, right. Yeah, Good back right. to the nurturing. Mm -hmm. I have to do everything because this is... Yeah. Or I'm afraid because something happened to my, uh, my mm -hmm. other children. Yeah, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. One final thing. Um, it said, and this is also the justification, love has very adult tastes. Yeah. yeah. But then it, they report that he sometimes steal food, steals food. So mm -hmm. when that happens, do we have to be concerned about um, hyperphagia as a medical diagnosis? And... Does he need to be evaluated for things like Prater Willie? I mean, usually those become come to attention um, earlier on in life. But he's still young enough at ten that you know Prater Willie's a spectrum. 
right. or autism or other things. So you don't necessarily see, I, I just gave you an example earlier about a kid that was being treated for epilepsy that ended up having Prager Willie. I mean, that was a, a late diet. It was masked by the other issues that were going on. So it doesn't mean that it couldn't be a problem. It, it Maybe that's not a diagnosis, but it would give you a place to start in terms of management. Um, the stealing food usually means that somebody in the environment has put restrictions on food. So that might be something to explore. What are the restrictions on the food? Mm. And is that, a, is that a response to mom and dad's different mm -hmm. um, approaches? Mm -hmm. I mean, have a dad every type self, one any self-respecting kids can play one off the other. Right. Yeah. <laughs> It's true. Or is in a household where everybody's in the same house, is there food insecurity? So that yeah. stealing is a result um, of mm. people came home from the grocery store and there's food now and there might not be food a week from now, so I'm going to overindulge while there's stuff here. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there's a lot of places that you could go with that. Certainly a child that I want to have follow-up. <laughs> Okay. As in our other case, Lauren, <laughs> go find this kid. <laughs> I know. You might be able to find the hemoglobin A1C now, but. Yeah. Yeah, if they'd allow me access. I don't know. Now. Who was your preceptor at the time? Uh, Laura Midbron. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you'll do is that Kathleen's going to type up the recommendations and she'll send it back to you. Oh, you great. need to send those back to the, you know, your preceptor. Oh, okay. Um, because these kids need to be followed up. Yeah, you know, you know, one, it, it's an academic exercise for you, but two, it's a, this is a real child with real issues, and so we need to make sure we don't lose them. Yeah, the process. And sometimes people don't realize when, when a case like this, when you have everybody together, it's like, wow, I didn't think about. Yeah, the challenges, but also the opportunities. If I do something right now, that maybe I won't be looking at something more complicated later on. Yeah, it was a big missed opportunity. And it could be a frequent flyer if they're going in with yeah. exacerbations all the time. So then you know the next time that they come in. Yeah, it would be mm -hmm. help. Like it would be helpful for me. I would like that if I saw these kids back a lot, which we do. <laughs> all right, we are way out of time. Well, um, thank you, any everyone. Um, did we get any everyone on the phones? I think we so. did. Okay. Um, we won't be having a session over spring break. No, no sessions, but so that one session, right, none over spring break, so no right. more this month. So the so next one will be April 5th. Um, so. No, actually, that's your PNT. I don't remember what it is. Yeah. Um, I believe it's April 5th. You will be getting an announcement. Um, and thank you for coming today. And this was a really great discussion. Most educational.